Chapter Two, Part One of A Divine Cordial. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. A Divine Cordial by Thomas Watson. Chapter Two the worst things work for good to the godly part one do not mistake me i do not say that of their own nature the worst things are good for they are a fruit of the curse but though they are naturally evil yet the wise overruling hand of god disposing and sanctifying them they are morally good as the elements though of contrary qualities yet god has so tempered them that they all work in a harmonious manner for the good of the universe or as in a watch the wheels seem to move contrary to one another but all carry on the motions of the watch so things that seem to move cross to the godly yet by the wonderful providence of god work for their good among these worst things there are four sad evils that work for the good to them that love god One the evil of affliction works for good to the godly it is one heart-quieting consideration in all the afflictions that befall us that god has a special hand in them the almighty hath addicted me ruth one twenty one instruments can no more stir till god gives them a commission than an axe can cut of itself without a hand job eyed god in his affliction Therefore, as Augustine observes, he does not say, The Lord gave, and the devil took away, but the Lord hath taken away. Whoever brings an affliction to us, it is God that sends it. Another heart-quieting consideration is that afflictions work for good. Like these good pips, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Jeremiah 24, 5 Judah's captivity in Babylon was for their good. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Psalm 119, 71 This text, like Moses' tree cast into the bitter waters of affliction, may make them sweet and wholesome to drink. Afflictions to the godly are medicinal. Out of the most poisonous drugs, God extracts our salvation. Afflictions are needful as ordinances. 1 Peter 1, 6. No vessel can be made of gold without fire, so it is impossible that we should be made vessels of honor unless we are melted and refined in the furnace of affliction. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth psalms twenty five ten as the painter intermixes bright colors with dark shadows so the wise god mixes mercy with judgment those afflictive providences which seem to be prejudicial are beneficial let us take some instances in scripture joseph's brethren throw him into a pit afterwards they sell him then he is cast into prison yet all this did work for his good his abasement made way for his advancement he was made the second man in the kingdom ye thought evil against me but god meant it for good genesis fifty twenty jacob wrestled with the angel and the hollow of jacob's thigh was out of joint this was sad but god turned it to good for there he saw god's face and there the lord blessed him Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. Genesis 32:30. Who would not be willing to have a bone out of joint, so that he might have a sight of God? King Manasseh was bound in chains. This was sad to see, a crown of gold changed into fetters. But it wrought for his good, for when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord and humbled himself greatly, and the Lord was entreated of him. Second Chronicles thirty three, eleven and twelve. He was more beholden to his iron chain than to his golden crown. 
The one made him proud, the other made him humble. Job was a spectacle of misery. He lost all that ever he had. He abounded only in boils and ulcers. This was sad, but it wrought for his good. His grace was proved and improved. God gave a testimony from heaven of his integrity, and did compensate his loss by giving him twice as much as ever he had before. Job 13.10 Paul was smitten with blindness. This was uncomfortable, but it turned to his good. God did by that blindness make way for the light of grace to shine into his soul. It was the beginning of a happy conversion. Acts 9, 6 As the hard frosts in winter bring on flowers in the spring, as the night ushers in the morning star, so the evils of affliction produce much good to those that love God. But we are ready to question the truth of this and say, as Mary did to the angel, How can this be? Therefore, I shall show you several ways how affliction works for good. 1. As it is our preacher and tutor. Hear ye the rod. Micah 6, 9. Luther said that he could never rightly understand some of the Psalms till he was in affliction. Affliction teaches what sin is. In the word preached, we hear what a dreadful thing sin is, that it is both defiling and damning, but we fear it no more than a painted lion. Therefore God lets loose affliction, and then we feel sin bitter in the fruit of it. A sickbed often teaches more than a sermon. We can best see the ugly visage of sin in the glass of affliction. Affliction teaches us to know ourselves. In prosperity we are, for the most part, strangers to ourselves. God makes us know affliction, that we may better know ourselves. We see that corruption in our hearts in the time of affliction, which we would not believe was there. Water in the glass looks clear, but set it on the fire, and the scum boils up. In prosperity, a man seems to be humble and thankful. The water looks clear, but set this man a little on the fire of affliction, and the scum boils up, and much impatience and unbelief appear. Oh, says a Christian, I never thought I had such a bad heart, as now I see I have. I never thought my corruptions had been so strong, and my graces so weak. 2. Afflictions work for good, as they are the means of making the heart more upright. In prosperity the heart is apt to be divided. Hosea 10.2 the heart cleaves partly to God and partly to the world. It is like a needle between two lodestones. God draws, and the world draws. Now God takes away the world, that the heart may cleave more to him in sincerity. Correction is a setting the heart right and straight. As we sometimes hold a crooked rod over the fire to straighten it, so God holds us over the fire of affliction, to make us more straight and upright. Oh, how good it is, when sin has bent the soul awry from God, that affliction should straighten it again. 3. Afflictions work for good, as they conform us to Christ. God's rod is a pencil to draw Christ's image more lively upon us. It is good that there should be symmetry and proportion between the head and the members. Would we be parts of Christ's mystical body, and not like him? His life, as Calvin says, was a series of sufferings, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, 3. He wept and bled. Was his head crowned with thorns, and do we think to be crowned with roses? It is good to be like Christ, though it be by sufferings. Jesus Christ drank a bitter cup. It made him sweat drops of blood to think of it. And though it be true he drank the poison in the cup, the wrath of God, yet there is some wormwood in the cup left which the saints must drink. Only here is the difference between Christ's sufferings and ours. His were satisfactory. Ours are only castigatory. 4. 
afflictions work for good to the godly as they are destructive to sin sin is the mother affliction is the daughter the daughter helps to destroy the mother sin is like the tree that breeds the worm and affliction is like the worm that eats the tree there is much corruption in the best heart affliction does by degrees work it out as the fire works out the dross from the gold this is all the fruit to take away his sin isaiah twenty seven nine what if we have more of the rough file if we have less rust afflictions carry away nothing but the dross of sin if a physician should say to a patient your body is distempered and full of bad humors which must be cleared out or you die but i will prescribe physic which though it may make you sick yet it will carry away the dregs of your disease and save your life would not this be good for the patient afflictions are the medicine which god uses to carry off our spiritual diseases they cure the tympany of pride the fever of lust the dropsy of covetousness do they not then work for good five afflictions work for good as they are the means of loosening our hearts from the world when you dig away the earth from the root of a tree it is to loosen the tree from the earth so god digs away our earthly comforts to loosen our hearts from the earth a thorn grows up with every flower god would have the world hang as a loose tooth which being twitched away does not much trouble us is it not good to be weaned the oldest saints need it why does the lord break the conduit pipe but that we may go to him in whom are all our fresh springs psalm eighty seven seven six afflictions work for good as they make way for comfort in the valley of Achor is a door of hope hosea two fifteen Achor signifies trouble god sweetens outward pain with inward peace your sorrow shall be turned into joy john twenty six twenty here is the water turned into wine after a bitter pill god gives sugar paul had his prison songs god's rod has honey at the end of it the saints in addiction have had such sweet raptures of joy that they thought themselves in the borders of the heavenly canaan seven afflictions work for good as they are magnifying of us what is man that thou shouldst magnify him and that thou shouldst visit him every morning job seven seventeen god does by affliction magnify us three ways first in that he will condescend so low as to take notice of us it is an honor that god will mind dust and ashes it is a magnifying of us that god thinks us worthy to be smitten god's not striking is a slighting why should he be stricken any more isaiah one five if you will go on in sin take your course sin yourselves into hell second afflictions also magnify us as they are ensigns of glory signs of sonship if you endure chastening god dealeth with you as sons hebrews twelve seven every print of the rod is a badge of honor third afflictions tend to the magnifying of the saints as they make them renowned in the world soldiers have never been so admired for their victories as the saints have been for their sufferings the zeal and constancy of the martyrs in their trials have rendered them famous to posterity how eminent was job for his patience god leaves his name upon record ye have heard of the patience of job james five eleven job the sufferer was more renowned than alexander the conqueror eight afflictions work for good as they are the means of making us happy happy is the man whom god correcteth job five seventeen what politician or moralist ever placed happiness in the cross job does 
happy is the man whom God correcteth. It may be said, how do afflictions make us happy? We reply that, being sanctified, they bring us nearer to God. The moon in the full is furthest off from the sun. So are many further off from God in the full moon of prosperity. Afflictions bring them nearer to God. The magnet of mercy does not draw us so near to God as the cords of affliction. When Absalom set Joab's corn on fire, then he came running to Absalom. Second Samuel 14.30 When God sets our worldly comforts on fire, then we run to him and make our peace with him. When the prodigal was pinched with want, then he returned home to his father. Luke 15.13 when the dove could not find any rest for the sole of her foot, then she flew to the ark. When God brings a deluge of affliction upon us, then we fly to the ark of Christ. Thus affliction makes us happy in bringing us nearer to God. Faith can make use of the waters of affliction to swim faster to Christ. 9. Afflictions work for good, as they put to silence the wicked. How ready are they to asperse and calumniate the godly that they serve God only for self-interest? Therefore God will have his people endure sufferings for religion that he may put a padlock on the lying lips of wicked men. When the atheists of the world see that God has a people who serve him not for a livery but for love, this stops their mouths. The devil accused Job of hypocrisy, that he was a mercenary man. All his religion was made up of ends of gold and silver. Doth Job serve God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him? etc. Well, says God, put forth thy hand, touch his estate. Job 1, 9 The devil had no sooner received a commission, but he falls at breaking down Job's hedge, but still Job worships God, Job 1.20, and professes his faith in him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, Job 13.15. This silenced the devil himself. How it strikes a damp into wicked men when they see that the godly will keep close to God in a suffering condition, and that, when they lose all, they yet will hold fast their integrity. 10. Afflictions work for good as they make way for glory. 2 Corinthians 4.17. Not that they merit glory, but they prepare for it. As plowing prepares the earth for a crop, so afflictions prepare and make us meet for glory. The painter lays his gold upon dark colors, so God first lays the dark colors of affliction and then he lays the golden color of glory. The vessel is first seasoned before wine is poured into it. The vessels of mercy are first seasoned with affliction, and then the wine of glory is poured in. Thus we see afflictions are not prejudicial, but beneficial to the saints. We should not so much look at the evil of affliction as the good, not so much at the dark side of the cloud as the light. The worst that God does to his children is to whip them to heaven. 2. The evil of temptation is overruled for good to the godly. The evil of temptation works for good. Satan is called the tempter, Mark 4.15. He is ever lying in ambush. He is continually at work with one saint or another. The devil has his circuit that he walks every day. He is not yet fully cast into prison, but, like a prisoner that goes under bail, he walks about to tempt the saints. This is a great molestation to a child of God. Now concerning Satan's temptations, there are three things to be considered. 1. His method in tempting. 2. The extent of his power. 3. These temptations are overruled for good. 1. Satan's method in tempting. Here take notice of two things, his violence in tempting, and so he is the red dragon. 
he labors to storm the castle of the heart he throws in thoughts of blasphemy he tempts to deny god these are the fiery darts he shoots by which he would inflame the passions also his subtlety in tempting and so he is the old serpent there are five chief subtleties the devil uses one he observes the temperament and constitution he lays suitable baits of temptation like the farmer he knows what grain is best for the soil satan will not tempt contrary to the natural disposition and temperament this is his policy he makes the wind and tide go together that way the natural tide of the heart runs that way the wind of temptation blows though the devil cannot know men's thoughts yet he knows their temperaments and accordingly he lays his baits he tempts the ambitious man with a crown the sanguine man with beauty two satan observes the fittest time to tempt in as a cunning angler casts in his angle when the fish will bite best satan's time of tempting is usually after an ordinance and the reason is he thinks he shall find us most secure when we have been at solemn duties we are apt to think all is done and we grow remiss and leave off that zeal and strictness as before just as a soldier who after a battle leaves off his armor not once dreaming of an enemy satan watches his time and when we least suspect then he throws in a temptation three he makes use of near relations the devil tempts by a proxy thus he handed over a temptation to job by his wife dost thou still retain thy integrity job two nine a wife in the bosom may be the devil's instrument to tempt to sin four satan tempts to evil by them that are good thus he gives poison in a golden cup he tempted christ by peter peter dissuades him from suffering master pity thyself who would have thought to have found the tempter in the mouth of an apostle five satan tempts to sin under a pretense of religion he is most to be feared when he transforms himself into an angel of light he came to christ with scripture in his mouth it is written the devil baits his hook with religion he tempts many a man to covetousness and extortion under a pretense of providing for his family he tempts some to do away with themselves that they may live no longer to sin against god and so he draws them into sin under a pretense of avoiding sin these are his subtle stratagems in tempting two the extent of his power how far satan's power in tempting reaches one he can propose the object as he set a wedge of gold before Aachen. two he can poison the fancy and instill evil thoughts into the mind as the holy ghost casts in good suggestions so the devil casts in bad ones he put it into judas's heart to betray christ john thirteen two three satan can excite and irritate the corruption within and work some kind of inclinableness in the heart to embrace a temptation though it is true satan cannot force the will to yield consent yet he being an earnest suitor by his continual solicitation may provoke to evil thus he provoked david to number the people first chronicles twenty one one the devil may by his subtle arguments dispute us into sin three these temptations are overruled for good to the children of god a tree that is shaken by the wind is more settled and rooted so the blowing of a temptation does but settle a christian the more in grace temptations are overruled for good in eight ways one temptation sends the soul to prayer the more furiously satan tempts the more fervently the saint prays the deer being shot with the dart runs faster to the water when satan shoots his fiery darts at the soul it then runs faster to the throne of grace 
when Paul had the messenger of Satan to buffet him, he says, For this I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 Temptation is a medicine for security. That which makes us pray more works for good. 2. Temptation to sin is a means to keep from the perpetration of sin. The more a child of God is tempted, the more he fights against the temptation. The more Satan tempts to blasphemy, the more a saint trembles at such thoughts and says, Get thee hence, Satan. When Joseph's mistress tempted him to folly, the stronger her temptation was, the stronger was his opposition. That temptation which the devil uses as a spur to sin, God makes a bridle to keep back a Christian from it. 3. Temptation works for good as it abates the swelling of pride. Lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. 2 Corinthians 12.7 The thorn in the flesh was to puncture the puffing up of pride. Better is that temptation which humbles me than that duty which makes me proud. Rather than a Christian shall be haughty-minded, God will let him fall into the devil's hands a while to be cured of his imposthume. 4. Temptation works for good, as it is a touchstone to try what is in the heart. The devil tempts that he may deceive, but God suffers us to be tempted to try us. Temptation is a trial of our sincerity. It argues that our heart is chaste and loyal to Christ when we can look a temptation in the face and turn our back upon it. Also it is a trial of our courage. Ephraim is a silly dove without heart. Hosea 7, 11. So it may be said of many, they are without a heart. They have no heart to resist temptation. No sooner does Satan come, but they yield, like a coward who, as soon as the thief approaches, gives him his purse. But he is the valorous Christian that brandishes the sword of the Spirit against Satan, and will rather die than yield. The courage of the Romans was never more seen than when they were assaulted by the Carthaginians. The valor and puissance of a saint is never more seen than on a battlefield when he is fighting the red dragon, and by the power of faith puts the devil to flight. That grace is tried in gold which can stand in the fiery trial and withstand fiery darts. 5. Temptations work for good, as God makes those who are tempted fit to comfort others in the same distress. A Christian must himself be under the buffetings of Satan before he can speak a word in due season to him that is weary. St. Paul was first in temptations. We are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11 Thus he was able to acquaint others with Satan's cursed wiles. 1 Corinthians 10.13 A man that has ridden over a place where there are bogs and quicksands is the fittest to guide others through that dangerous way. He that has felt the claws of the roaring lion and has lain bleeding under those wounds, is the fittest man to deal with one that is tempted. None can better discover Satan's slights and policies than those who have been long in the fencing school of temptation. 6. Temptations work for good as they stir up paternal compassion in God to them who are tempted. The child who is sick and bruised is most looked after. When a saint lies under the bruising of temptations, Christ prays, and God the Father pities. When Satan puts the soul into a fever, God comes with a cordial, which made Luther say that temptations are Christ's embraces, because he then most sweetly manifests himself to the soul. 7. Temptations work for good, as they make the saints long more for heaven. There they shall be out of gunshot. Heaven is a place of rest. No bullets of temptation fly there. The eagle that soars aloft in the air and sits upon high trees is not troubled with the stinging of the serpent. So when believers are ascended to heaven, 
they shall not be molested with the old serpent. In this life, when one temptation is over, another comes. This is to make God's people wish for death to sound a retreat, and call them off the field where the bullets fly so quick to receive a victorious crown, where not the drum or cannon, but the harp and viol, shall be ever sounding. 8. Temptations work for good as they engage the strength of Christ. Christ is our friend, and when we are tempted, he sets all his power working for us. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Hebrews 2.18 If a poor soul was to fight alone with the Goliath of hell, he would be sure to be vanquished. But Jesus Christ brings in his auxiliary forces. He gives fresh supplies of grace. And through him we are more than conquerors. Romans 8.37 Thus the evil of temptation is overruled for good. Question. But sometimes Satan foils a child of God. How does this work for good? Answer. I grant that through the suspension of divine grace and the fury of a temptation, a saint may be overcome. Yet this foiling by a temptation shall be overruled for good. By this foil God makes way for the augmentation of grace. Peter was tempted to self-confidence. He presumed upon his own strength, and when he would needs stand alone, Christ let him fall. But this wrought for his good. It cost him many a tear, he went out and wept bitterly. Matthew 26.75 And now he grows more modest. He durst not say he loved Christ more than the other apostles. Lovest thou me more than these? John 21.15 He durst not say so. His fall broke the neck of his pride. The foiling by a temptation causes more circumspection and watchfulness in a child of God. Though Satan did before decoy him into sin, yet for the future he will be the more cautious. He will have a care of coming within the lion's chain any more. He is more shy and fearful of the occasions of sin. He never goes out without his spiritual armor, and he girds on his armor by prayer. He knows he walks on slippery ground, therefore he looks wisely to his steps. He keeps close sentinel in his soul, and when he spies the devil coming, he stands to his arms and displays the skill of faith. Ephesians 6, 16 This is all the hurt the devil does. When he foils a saint by temptation, he cures him of his careless neglect. He makes him watch and pray more. When the wild beasts get over the hedge and hurt the corn, a man will make his fence the stronger. So, when the devil gets over the hedge by a temptation, a Christian will be sure to mend his fence. He will become more fearful of sin and careful of duty. Thus, the being worsted by temptation works for good. Objection. But if being foiled works for good, this may make Christians careless whether they are overcome by temptation or no. Answer. There is a great deal of difference between falling into a temptation and running into a temptation. The falling into a temptation shall work for good, not the running into it. He that falls into a river is capable of help and pity, but he that desperately turns into it is guilty of his own death. It is madness running into a lion's den. He that runs himself into a temptation is like Saul who fell upon his own sword. From all that has been said, see how God disappoints the old serpent, making his temptations turn to the good of his people. Surely, if the devil knew how much benefit accrues to the saints by temptation, he would forbear to tempt. Luther once said, There are three things make a Christian. Prayer, meditation, and temptation. St. Paul in his voyage to Rome met with a contrary wind. Acts 27, 4. So the wind of temptation is a contrary wind to that of the Spirit, but God makes use of this cross wind to blow the saints to heaven. 
End of chapter 2, part 1. Recording by Jeff Chestnut.